Aloha, my friends. Aloha. All you troopers, how about a, a round of applause for the incredible staff who, who transformed this room from the Copacabana uh, back to a meeting room. What an incredible event, uh, a series of events last night. And I want to thank our host city and our incredible USCM staff and all our contractors for making it special. Uh, I want to take this moment to report on our dollar-wise campaign and its new focus on economic mobility. Um, many of you may know the Dollar Wise campaign has a three-tiered approach. Uh, first, removing barriers such as excessive fines and fees that economically trap underserved people. Second, creating educational opportunities like universal pre-K, child savings accounts, and skills training. And third, helping people build wealth that they can pass on to future generations. Historically, Dollar Wise has been focused on financial education, uh, and we're, we're going to continue those activities, but this is not always enough. We've got to put people back on their feet again. And we're doing some exciting work, but we're only just getting started. Uh, recently, Dollar Wise assisted Dayton Mayor Nan Whaley uh, to restore suspended licenses, driver's licenses, through its employment legal aid clinic. Two weeks ago, over 600 people showed up at Dayton's municipal court building to have their licenses restored. Uh, that's making a real difference. In April, Mayor Sheevy held a graduation ceremony for Reno Works, an innovative 12-week program designed to uniquely address homelessness in Reno. 82% of all participants graduate with a steady job and an income. Uh, Dollarwise is also working with Lansing Mayor Andy Shore to expand his citywide child savings account initiative. Uh, with, with Albany Mayor Kathy Sheehan to help build her summer youth jobs program and with New Orleans Mayor Latoya Cantrell to expand her welcoming program, which provides mentorship and professional skills to justice-involved youth. Uh, we know that many of, of others, many of you in this room, are doing some really exciting work in this space. Uh, we currently have an economic, economic mobility survey uh, in the field to co collect and promote best practices. We're going to release that survey uh, sometime in the fall. If you haven't already filled out the survey, please do so. Uh, finally, we're excited to announce the eighth annual Summer Youth Jobs Contest, where youth and summer jobs can go online and win prizes, including iPads and completing a set uh, for completing a set of financial education modules. Um, this is made possible by BetterMoneyHabits.com. Uh, please sign up at the Dollar Wise booth outside in the lobby. And as always, we welcome Bank of America uh, for being our Dollar Wise founding sponsor, making all this possible. Uh, a round of applause to Bank of America, please. I really want to thank all the mayors who participate uh, in our efforts to promote economic mobility. I want to encourage so many more to continue to participate. So uh, some of you may remember in previous years we started this, and, and this has become so much fun. Um, this plenary is called the Civic I.O. Uh, plenary, uh, naming it uh, after the wonderful mayor summit, the Conference of Mayors co-hosts with Civic I.O. and the city of Austin uh, during uh, South by Southwest each year. Uh, the event started in 2016 has become quickly become a fixture of the Conference of Mayors uh, every March. To explain a little bit of, of what we do each March, I'd like to invite to the stage the host of the Civic I.O. Mayor Summit, the mayor of Austin, Texas, and chair of our Technology and Innovation Task Force, Steve Adler. So good morning. It's, uh, it's me again. And I get to talk about Austin again. I, you know, I, I, next year, I hope everybody's coming to the, uh, to, the, to the annual meeting as we talked about yesterday. Uh, but there's another opportunity to visit Austin uh, in March that I really want everybody to consider. This is not open to everyone. Uh, so you have to uh, indicate an, an interest to be able to, to come, but the, the South by Southwest Festival that is in Austin uh, has opened up a special mayor's track. Uh, South by Southwest is the quintessential Austin story. It really does capture the spirit and soul of the city. Uh, it is a music festival, a film festival, but, but what is really driving it right now is the interactive and education part. Uh, it is pulling together probably the preeminent world uh, event, uh, World's Fair of the Future, 
pulling in uh, entrepreneurs and, and innovators, uh, new platform folks along with, uh, with the top venture capital um, uh, uh, folks uh, and, and entities in the world, putting them all in the same place. Uh, to, to see what is going to be launched that's going to be changing the world. Scooters, uh, we all got to try those for the very first time uh, uh, a, year, uh, a year ago, uh, back before they had shown up on any of our streets. This is where Twitter uh, effectively had its launch. Uh, you know, you kind of think of it as, uh, as, as space camp for, for mayors. Uh, it's, uh, but instead of uh, geeking out on space, folks are geeking out on innovation uh, and the intersection of innovation with uh, uh, municipal policy uh, challenges. So every March, we create opportunities for mayors to be on panels with some of these innovators and venture capitalists to attend uh, the workshops. The, the folks that come in are really the folks that are setting the agenda for the next decade. Uh, not only in our cities, but, uh, but also uh, in, in the world. It ties in to uh, uh, President Benjamin and, 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 and Brian's three eyes that we work with. It is a spectacular way to see our city. About 250,000 people uh, come to Austin to be part of South by Southwest. Uh, and in the last five years, I think the, the, the program has really benefited from putting mayors on the stage and on panels. Uh, but I also know that, that even the, the pitch contest that mayors do, where we award uh, money, uh, we curate a pitch contest toward the end of the several days, uh, some incredible ideas have, have come forward now that are being marketed to, to cities uh, across, the, across the country. Uh, there's going to be another opportunity to do this this spring. You know, I know that it's hard sometimes to get away from your cities. It's doubly hard to visit the same city twice in a given year. Uh, but if you're a mayor and you have a limited period, period of time in the office and you're trying to maximize your exposure uh, to new ideas and new innovation, I would urge you uh, to also consider coming to South by Southwest. And to speak about it, I have the opportunity to, uh, to, to introduce uh, Monica Sack, who is the head of uh, programming. Um, uh, advancement at South by Southwest. Monica. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Mayor Adler, and to the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And uh, it's been a really wonderful couple of days, so I also want to thank the city of Honolulu for hosting this amazing event. Um, let's see. Okay, as um, Mayor Adler mentioned, my name is Monica Sack. I am the head of programming and advancement and the content lead for the government and politics track at South by Southwest. I wanted to take a few moments today to tell you about our event and here are a few of the items that I will be discussing today. South by Southwest dedicates itself to helping creative people achieve their goals. This is pretty much our mission statement drawing over 300,000 attendees across 10 days of programming, South by Southwest brings together 106 different countries from all around the world, giving everyone an opportunity to share ideas and projects so that we can all learn from one another and be inspired by one another. It's truly a really unique environment. One of the main components of the event is the South by Southwest conference. While there are many different themes across 20 different tracks of programming, I wanted to highlight just a few that I think you may all find really relevant in your, let's say, line of work. Um, government and politics. We really, try and, um, we really try hard to discuss topics that affect the lives of all of the citizens, from livable cities to security and privacy concerns to civic engagement challenges. Last year, um, Hawaii Senator Maisie Hirono sat down with Guy Kawasaki to discuss the state of American government as well as the current political climate. It was really fascinating. Um, we also had Mayor Pete as one of our featured speakers on our conversations about the future of America series. 
He was also a panelist on a session we had in our government track called the City Hall Blueprint for Running the Country. I think we would all agree it would be better if we ran things like City Hall does. Um, another theme that we have is tech innovation. Um, it, this runs across a lot of our tracks of programming. We want to be able to let our attendees know what new technologies are on the horizon, along with the challenges that come along with that technology. A few more specific topics in this area include machine learning, the Internet of Things, the XR space and what's up and coming there, and deep dives into product development. This was one of our featured sessions from last year with Malcolm Gladwell, Chris Urmson, and moderated by Jolene Kent. They discussed how close we really are to having self-driving cars on our roads, how it fits with our current public transportation models, and some of the main challenges that come along with implementing this type of technology. And here we had a featured session with Dennis Crowley and Laurie Siegel, touching on the ethics regarding some of today's technology, specifically around the ethics of location sharing applications. Entrepreneurship. We showcase a lot of different startups so that our attendees have an idea of what's up and coming. Understanding how businesses operate as well as the challenges that they encounter can be crucial to their success. Here is Kimberly Bryant speaking on Behind the Click, Securing the Future for Black Women and Girls in Tech. She actually invited some of the students on stage with her to participate in this really con um, important conversation. And here is an image from uh, one of the South by Southwest pitch events. Last year in this category, the blockchain technology, the winner was Nebula Genomics. They offer consumers and patients affordable personal genome sequencing, which is going to be a huge topic in our near future. Social impact focuses on community inclusion, how for-profit companies can better work with nonprofit organizations, and taking a more proactive approach to climate action uh, initiatives. Our opening speaker last year, Brene Brown, helped us define belonging, community, and connection in an age of increased polariz polarization. And the ACLU put together this panel featuring Amber Heard, Ike Barinholtz, and Padma Lakshmid on social activism, the importance of speaking out against oppression and injustice, and culture and entertainment, understanding what is happening in this space definitely helps our ability to um, understand what is good for our community. We had Jim Bankoff and Soledad O'Brien sitting down for a conversation on what's next for the media and entertainment industries. And the cast of The Daily Show also came to South by last year to remind us that while it's really important to, um, to understand all of the cultural events happening in our world, we also need to be able to take a moment and laugh at what's happening around our world. Beyond the conference, here are a couple of other events that I wanted to highlight. If you're in South by, you have to catch a film screening, music showcases. We have awards shows. We have one specifically um, that I wanted to call out was the Community Service Awards. You can see amazing things that people are doing. Um, pitch events, trade show. My time is up, so I'm trying to hurry. Um, lastly, Civic I.O. Um, whether you are President Barack Obama or Mayor Pete, South by Southwest has become a major platform to discuss our country and our world's most critical issues. As people become more aware that the change starts on a city level, mayors have become an integral part of the discussion on a variety of topics. And South by Southwest works with Civic IO to curate sessions focused on content we know will be extremely valuable to our attendees. Civic IO also creates a very specific agenda and events for the mayors that attend as a way to maximize the time in Austin. With 100 uh, of programs, sessions, and experiences going on at the same time. South by Southwest can be very overwhelming at times, but the mayors have the advantage of having an opportunity to participate in Civic I.O. Looking at South by Southwest in 2020 and beyond, Civic I.O. and South by Southwest will continue working to bring the nation's mayors together with the most dynamic leaders in the world to tackle society's biggest challenges through innovation, discovery, and leadership. So we hope that you will be able to join us for South by Southwest 2020, um, and that is in March in Austin, Texas. And if you have any further questions, I've included uh, contact information
for both South by Southwest and Civic IO. And I really thank you for your time this morning and have a good rest of the conference. We have a thundering herd of optimism in the mayors. It's been really awesome watching all the mayors learn and, and, and create the space for themselves to learn. Learn new vocabularies about inclusion, about innovation. Well, I think specifically when we do this work here in Civic I.O., we're talking about things that are more long-term and thinking about the future of our communities, the future of our country, and the future of our world. Entrepreneurship and technology to solve some of the hardest problems in our society. I think there's a confidence in the entrepreneurial and innovation and technology community. I, I think you can't come to South by Southwest as a mayor without being completely transformed. Civic Tech Pitch is where we get to see the very best ideas uh, from all around the country, indeed and around the world. This is one of the most dynamic experiences that happens anywhere in the world. Uh, it is, uh, as Mayor Adler likes to call it, the, uh, the conference of ideas. A little bit about Civic I.O. Our mission is to be an innovation catalyst. We are working with cities and mayors so that they can imagine and realize a different future and what is truly possible for them. I, I don't think there's any uh, gathering of folks more creative, more energized, more solution-oriented, um, big dreamers, folks that have capital and capacity. Um, this is where you want to be. Uh, uh, this is a, certainly where I want to be because I want to bring my community uh, to the forefront. An invaluable experience. Like You cannot get this type of experience anywhere else to be around the type of leaders you're around, to be a type of, around the type of innovators that you get to experience and encounter here. Um, it is well worth the trip. SpaceX, you know, Elon Musk says that one day uh, you're going to be going to Mars. I mean, those are all things that futuristic uh, actors have to start thinking about, and how do you do all the ethics connected with that? Within the context of South by Southwest, the, uh, the, the environment of innovation and technology and forward thinking uh, really just energizes you to go back home and, and do, do bigger and better things. Acting locally and thinking globally is so much more a reality to me right now. This is a magical place. Uh, we're on a roll right now. Uh, and it's a, it's a city that's attracting people and ideas and, and new ways of thinking. You guys have got to be excited, right? This is always so much fun. It's now my pleasure to get underway with our mayor's matchup civic tech pitch. Uh, it's a little bit different from the pitches we've done in the past. Uh, this year we partnered with Kapor Capital, a venture fund, a base, uh, that's the Kapor crew, I love it. A venture fund based in Oakland, California, which invests in startups that have the ability to transform entire industries and to address urgent social needs as they do so. Many of the startups, uh, of their startups, are doing such great work in civic tech and solving challenges that cities face. I encourage you to make sure you, you, you connect with the Kapor Capital crew right here. You guys wave your hands again. Uh, we're, we're so thankful for your partnership. Uh, before I go over the rules, I'd like to introduce our four judges. Uh, the mayor of Kansas City, Missouri, uh, Sly James. Come on, Sly. The mayor of Shreveport, Louisiana, Adrian Perkins. The mayor of New Orleans, Louisiana, Latoya Cantrell. And you guys are so used to seeing our, our Mark Cuban of our Shark Tank, West Sacramento Mayor Christopher Cabaldin. Um, so here are the, the rules for today's pitches. Um, each of our five finalists will have four minutes to pitch their product. You can see the countdown clock on the stage, and at the end of four minutes, uh, they'll hear a buzzer. that will let them know the time has expired. Buzzer. <laughs> Yeah, it would, it would be helpful at city council meetings, I know, it would be. <laughs> After each pitch, our panel of mayoral judges will be able to ask questions for two minutes. Um, everyone in this audience will be able to participate as well, so if you open up the Civic I.O. Uh, plenary session inside the USCM mobile app, you can also vote uh, along uh, in, the tech, in the tech pitch. So, with the rules out of the way, let's meet our very first contestant, Davida Herzl of Acloma.
Hello, my name is Davida Herzl, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of ACLIMA. Our story starts at 16,000 feet. When astronauts go to space and they first see the planet, they're often struck by the thinness of that blue layer of breathable air that supports life. Now, with accelerating emissions due to increasing urbanization and population growth, that breathable layer of air is under increasing pressure. That has translated into a global air pollution crisis, with 90% of the world's population now breathing unhealthy air. And the front line of that challenge is being faced by our cities. In the United States, over 141 million Americans are exposed to toxic air. Uh, and, and the challenge is disproportionately impacting uh, communities of color, women, and children. This is having profound uh, human health effects that are also uh, having tremendous economic impacts. Uh, and now we know that air pollution is affecting every single organ in the human body at every phase of life. To address this challenge, we need, we need to start with a simple mantra. Uh, we need to m measure what we manage, yet traditional approaches of measurement are extremely expensive and difficult to deploy. A single station can cost up to a million dollars. ACLMA is introducing a transformative new approach to air pollution monitoring that gives mayors superpowers to see pollution and emissions with block-by-block -block resolution. ACLMA is on an ambitious mission to bring this technology to over 100 metro areas across the United States and around the world, to bring this uh, incredibly urgent data to mayors, cities, and local decision makers. Our technology is able to scale incredibly quickly because we're leveraging connected vehicles. Our sensors ride along and map every city street by street. We take care of everything end to end. We manage the network uh, so that mayors can really focus on action and focus their resources on taking action. Our platform is backed by years of R&D and scientific validation to create a solution that really goes to work for you over 10 years of, of, of effort to get to this point. We measure what matters, all of the pollutants that are most important for human health and for the health of that breathable layer of atmosphere. With our platform, we're able to deploy at scales that were previously impossible. We can cover an entire city in one quarter with that block-by-block -block resolution data that reflects the lived experience of your cities. And today, now, with this approach, air understanding local air pollution is fast and easy and doesn't require uh, upfront capital expense. All mayors and local decision makers need to do is sign on to our software platform and immediately you have access to, to pollution data block by block so that you can zoom in and identify where problems are in target, target interventions. This capability to diagnose and act puts hands, uh, power in the hands of decision makers. Um, as an example, uh, we're working uh, in San Diego County. This is a map of, uh, uh, of, of neighborhoods, environmental justice neighborhoods that we mapped uh, in, in San Diego. And on the, on the right um, is a map of the schools in this particular environmental justice community. And with this data, their uh, policymakers and local decision makers are now able to see which school is most impacted by pollution. And they're now able to leverage the $19 million in state funds that they received in a really targeted and focused uh, fashion to ensure that they're having impact where it's most needed. We also deliver this data to communities through a free, free application. And we're now deploying our technology across California and have been adopted by the top regulators in the world and will be deployed to 100 municipalities uh, in the next 12 months. We're very excited to work with all of you and to partner together to build healthier, more, more resilient and sustainable cities. Uh, uh, looking forward to, to speaking with all of you. Thank you so much. So is this a nonprofit? No, we are a business. We are a for good, for impact business. So how do you get paid? Um, we, uh, uh, our customers subscribe to software licenses. Uh -huh. uh, we don't sell hardware. We make it really easy and frictionless to adopt the service through a, through a software license. Is the cost of the software license scaled to the size of the city? No, it's not. We're able, because we're able to monetize the data across a lot of different industries, um, cities don't bear the full burden of the cost uh, of actually deploying our networks. I see, so the, the, the use case for me as a mayor, I, I, I see the, the use, for example, in Barrio Logan, but, but as a like monthly use. What would yes. I, if you're updating the, 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 the car yes. quarterly, yes. and I need real-time data, mm -hmm. 
and I'm only making a certain number of decisions a year around environmental justice issues location-based, why would I want to subscribe to an ongoing service as opposed to get a point in time once every, couple, every year um, or two? So our maps are what we call baseline maps because that baseline of persistent pollution is changing on a continuous basis. And what we've proven is that persistence matters, right? That we can identify the exact location of persistent hotspots, and that's what matters when it comes to long-term health effects. But that kind of data also helps to inform land use decisions uh, urban planning decisions, um, whether you prioritize investment in dollars into policy, into, into investing in green infrastructure, for example, it informs a very uh, broad range of decisions. And in fact, because we have this new granularity of information now, there's actually a breadth of decisions that didn't have data before to support them. So it opens up a lot of opportunities. Just one other question, the, the, the sensor, so the sensor driving on a, on a car yes. through the city, I'm trying to reduce the number of cars on the streets. Yes. Um, <laughs> Do you see a future path where the sensor might be somewhere else or on some other vehicle that's doing, you know, the Google vehicles that are mapping or in sure. some other way that would allow us to get one more frequent real-time data, but also not necessarily by vehicle? Yeah, so uh, today we're leveraging really the trends, <laughs> the trends in mobility and, and existing fleets. So we're leveraging existing fleets already deployed. Thank Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I do want the record to reflect, I am not in charge of the buzzer, okay? I, I, it's, it's, not, it's not me, Frida, know this, it's not me with the buzzer, okay? <laughs> All right, next up, Kristen Jones of Court Buddy. Good morning, my name is Christina Jones and I'm the co-founder of Court Buddy. It's a legal tech company that is bringing access to justice to your constituents who did not have access to it before. So let's begin. We all know in our cities the rich can afford law firms. The poor have solutions like legal aid and pro bono attorneys. But what about your middle class constituents? Where's their access to justice? Before launching Court Buddy, we identified that 129 million Americans were going to court alone. And when your constituents don't have access to legal services, they pull from your city's resources and budgets. In New York City, if a tenant walks into court alone, 50% of the time they will get evicted. But if an attorney could be there to even just write a response on their behalf, 90% will stay in their homes. So are you ready for the solution? <laughs> this is a solution that's not gonna pull from your budgets and a solution that doesn't even have to go through the procurement process. I'd like to introduce you to CourtBuddy.com. We instantly match your constituents with a local vetted solo attorney for unbundled legal services at flat rates. Once matched, they can instant message, video chat, and even call on the app. They can make secure payments and even set up payment plans from the comfort of their home. What this means is that your rural and urban constituents, now if they have issues with transportation, no longer have to worry about getting to that attorney. They can do it from the comfort of their home. Coming this year is Case Tracker, which allows your constituents to track their case from beginning to end. And it's smart enough to suggest what's coming next so the attorney and the client can stay on top of the case. We also have identified that some of your constituents might not know they have a legal need or they might not know the type of attorney that they need. So using uh, a machine learning algorithm, they can speak or write in their natural language to describe the case. And if your constituents do not read or write, they can select groups of photos and we can quickly identify what type of case and what type of attorney that they need. This isn't just a win-win situation. Corporate is actually a win-win, win-win. It's a win for your constituents because they no longer have to go into court alone and afraid. It's a win for your solo attorneys, your small businesses that now have access to new capital. It's a win for your courthouses that can now run more efficiently. And it's a win for you. It's a win because you can provide this service to them without disrupting your budget. 
My co-founder James Jones and I have identified 30 cities that are in this room where Corporate is not active yet. But that doesn't mean that we can't turn you on today. So please email us after or come see us and we can talk. If you are not on this list, that means we are already active in your city. But let's continue this conversation. We'd love to be introduced to the boots on the ground that are working on your access to justice initiatives so that we can be a part of the conversation. And we have data. We can provide your city with the data that they need to know how many constituents are getting matched a day, what are the practice areas that they're selecting, and is that changing over time, and what are the rates that they can afford in your city. We look forward to continuing the conversation, meeting all of you, and helping your cities in their access to justice. I'll say great presentation, uh, first of all, and uh, this seems like a legal Zoom, a more expansive version of legal, legal Zoom, so, so uh, I think we can very much benefit from this technology, but me and my sister Mary over here are from a jurisdiction that has a very special uh, type of law in Louisiana. Uh, how are you accounting for all the variables in the jurisdictions that you're working in? Yeah, so we spend a lot of time uh, focused on like what local needs or what the local needs are for each jurisdiction. Um, and so, for example, obviously we're um, focused on court-related matters. Um, so that spans, you know, bankruptcy, family law, uh, commercial litigation. But we really dive deep into each uh, local jurisdiction to find out what um, those local needs are. What's the timeline associated uh, with that deeper dive? If you come into a city. What's the requirement, what, you know, the burden on that city? What is the time? Yeah, it really depends. Um, I mean, a lot of times it's also regulatory issues we have to understand as well. So, um, you know, it could range for a month, from a month to, you know, six months. Um, I think the longest lead time was maybe about six to seven months. Uh, but we try to get into jurisdictions as quickly as possible based on the demand. How is the flat rate determined? That's determined by both the consumers as well as the attorneys. So even when we uh, initially launched Court Budget, we spent a lot of time uh, talking to both consumers in different jurisdictions as well as attorneys to figure out what the sweet spot would be uh, for different practice areas. And that's how we ultimately determined it. And of course, we're calibrating it as we continue to um, grow into different markets. And the quality of the attorneys. So they go through a vetting process. So once they say that they want to be on the system, we first make sure that they're in good standing. We make sure that they don't have any discipline, disciplinary actions against them in the past. And then we also allow the clients that are working with them to continue over time to rate them. And we keep a, a, a very close eye on what our clients are saying about the attorneys. Do the attorneys buy into the system? A lot of systems that advertise and use attorneys on a wholesale basis, the attorneys will actually pay a fee to get into that system. Is that true here? So it's free. There's a free option for the attorney to get matched with one client a month. If they have a practice where they want to grow fast, they can have a $99 membership. So it still is low cost for them. Thank you. All right. Thank you, judges. Thank you. Thank Christina and James. And now our third contestant is Phaedra Ellis Lampkins of Promise. <laughs> I appreciate, I hope that's one of our cities that we gave a discount to. They always appreciate and represent. Do anything for a little bit of a bargain, I appreciate it. My name is Phaedra, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Promise. We are a cost-effective, humane alternative to incarceration. We work with jurisdictions to figure out how to scale some of the amazing programs they have to stop and encourage so that people don't recidivate. What we found is that there's these amazing programs that are happening across the country, but they sometimes help 100 people and they're very expensive. And so we use technology to scale those programs. In order to do this, we had to hire some of the best technologists from across the country, from companies like Google, Facebook, Uber, and Stripe. And we focus on four things. First, preventing residents from entering the criminal justice system. Second, reducing the negative impact of snowballing fees and fines. Three, integrating easily and providing real-time dashboards so that jurisdictions know what's happening, what's working, and what's not. Last is we provide tools designed with low-income residents in mind. 
We recognize if you don't have a credit card, you need to find somewhere local to pay cash. You might want to pay with the Cash App or Venmo or something else. And that's what our focus is. The good news is we're trusted by jurisdictions across the country. We're in places like Cass County, North Dakota, to Kentucky, to California. And what we've learned, our first product is working with people under community supervision. So what that means in places like Oakland, California, it used to be that 78% of people showed up for court in something like October or November of last year. With our product, 100% of people using it showed up for court last month. And that's what we do. We figure out how do you use software to work with low-income people or people who've been impacted by the criminal justice system to show up for court. Part of what we learned, though, is that there was a gateway into the criminal justice system, and that was parking and traffic tickets. You may know someone who had a suspended driver's license who got arrested, and we realized that you need earlier interventions than community supervision. So here's what we just have announced. We're doing a program called Promise Pay. Because one thing we think that's important for people to understand is you want people to pay, and we want to make it as easy as possible. So we have a way where people can pay cash, cash app, Venmo, credit card. They can put themselves on a payment plan to pay credit card, using their credit cards or other things to pay their parking or traffic tickets. The private sector has realized that if you allow payment plans, people are more likely to pay. Here's the reality. People ignore tickets when they can't afford it and they can't pay. They lose their driver's license, they lose their cars, and it has a significant impact on cities. It's also really difficult to put yourself on a payment plan. In some places, it's $120 just to use a payment plan. You have to come to court. You have to show proof of payment. In some places, they don't take a credit card. We have to make it easier for people to pay. Research shows that when you do allow people to make payment plans in cities that have, they've increased revenue by a couple hundred percent in that population. So we make it easy. You scan a ticket, you can pay as many ways, we have standard and low-income payment plans, and then we remind people that they need to pay. What we do is we increase revenue for cities so you know when and how much you're getting. We improve the resident experience so that the people can pay and put themselves on payment plans, and we increase efficiency. So instead of standing in line, instead of only being able to make payments for eight hours a day, 24 hours a day in your neighborhood, pay your ticket, keep yourself out of jail. Thank you. Have you thought about a joint venture with Court Buddy? Uh, yes, we, uh, we have. We like uh, Court Buddy a lot. And we've talked a lot of, um, part of what we have to figure out is because we have information that's protected, how do you work with the private sector? Because local jurisdictions tend to be very private about the information that they give us. And so we protect that first. And I want to steal his question. Are you a nonprofit or a for-profit? We're a for-profit. Okay. And the reason I ask is because uh, a lot of states, especially in the Southeast, are going through criminal justice reform bills. And the public sector is putting a lot of money into programs that help recidivism. And I know your program also tries to prevent people from getting in the criminal justice system. But you also have a recidivism element to it. So there would be some funding available to, for that. But um, no, yeah. I understand if it's Yeah, we, we were a for-profit because we wanted to be able to not just hire, we thought, some of the best technologists, but because we wanted people who understood scale. And some of our nonprofit partners who we have do amazing work are really amazing at, at like walking someone to the DMV. We like to use technology so someone can get a driver's license so we can get 1,000 people through instead of one a day. What other companies are in this space? Yeah, it's a great question. So there's one big former Xerox company, and so what's great is like they won't do payment plans because their technology is old and outdated is the most gracious way I can say it. Um, Xerox is old and outdated? So old. <laughs> uh, yeah, like they don't, you know, so, so it's a great space for a company like ours because we have engineers, we can build quickly and rapidly. They can't do a payment plan, and so one of our first clients that will be announced soon is one of the largest cities in the country, and it's because they won't do a payment plan with them. Phaedra, this exists at the interface between cities and counties in a lot yep. of places. So I'm, so I'm curious, uh, you know, San Francisco and some of the larger cities that are both is, is, one, is an, a very clear value proposition. But how are you framing this for cities for whom the justice system itself is in a, some other place um, and where the state intercepts most of our traffic fine revenue anyway? What's, how, how are you framing the value proposition at the city level? Yeah, I really appreciate that. 
that question, and we're on the East Palo Alto City Council agenda on Tuesday, which is why we're leaving early, and they have that where they're working with the counties. And so what we've been able to figure out is how do we use the interface so that we deposit the money straight into their accounts, and then we pull the information from the county. So it's basically a push-pull where we're working with the county system. We get the number, basically, of the ticket, and then we pay them directly so that they don't have to pay the county the fee. They just take, we take 3% instead of the county fee. So. Thank you. Thank you. Our fourth pitch today is Dylan Twombly of BIA. Morning, my name is Dylan Twombly. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at VIA, and I'm excited to talk to you today about some of the mobility solutions that we're launching in partnership with cities and transit agencies across the country and across the world. As you mayors are aware, there's an urgent need for new mobility solutions. We can no longer continue to build roads and rely on the single passenger car uh, to solve our transportation challenges. However, at the same time, traditional mass transit solutions are not the answer. Fixed route buses are inconvenient and inefficient and often lack the quality of service that today's riders demand. At the same time, heavy infrastructure projects like light rail and subway often come in late and over budget and aren't right for every city. As a result, cities are looking for flexible, innovative solutions that can solve their transportation challenges. VIA is this solution. Our technology takes riders traveling in a similar direction, aggregates them into a single vehicle at a very high quality of service. We're taking single passenger vehicles off the road, reducing congestion and emissions, and we're doing this in partnership with cities and transit agencies all over the world, ranging from Newton, Massachusetts, to Arlington, Texas, to West Sacramento, California, to Seattle, to LA, to Columbus, Ohio. We're working with them to solve their biggest transportation challenges, challenges like growing ridership, providing service in transit deserts like we do in Arlington and West Sacramento, providing first and last mile services so that employees can get to work on time reliably every day, often as part of mayor's economic empowerment programs, as we do in LA and Seattle. We're also looking to expand access and provide a far better alternative to traditional paratransit and dial-a-ride services as we're doing in Newton, Massachusetts. We've done this in more than 75 cities, 17 countries, and 18 states, rural, suburban, urban environments. And we do this in two ways. The first is we take our technology and partner with you, with your vehicles and your drivers, to run a microtransit on-demand system as part of your transportation network. The second way is we can provide a turnkey service with vehicles, drivers, and technology, and again, operate a microtransit service on your behalf as part of your mass transit network. In both of these cases, we're bringing operational expertise from running millions and millions of rides a month on our consumer business to help you be successful and to optimize your overall mass transit network. The important thing to remember throughout all of these deployments is that it's your service. These are co-branded vehicles, co-branded app. You own the data. You control rider pricing and service parameters. We're there as an operational advisor to facilitate success and to help optimize your overall mass transit network. I look forward to talking with many of the mayors here about how we can help you address your mobility challenges, and uh, thanks very much. So you're in a lot of different places, and I imagine that some are more successful than others. Where have you failed? So one of the most important things for us as we deploy is figuring out what success looks like for the, for the city. Right? Some cities are looking at economic empowerment, so they want to ensure that citizens have a reliable way to get to work, or they want to drive ridership. So we look at modal shift. How many new riders do we have on your mass transit network? How many single passenger vehicles have we gotten off, um, off the roads? Uh, I think it, it, we have a lot of pilots that folks will take, that will do. Um, I think the one thing that we, I would say, uh, isn't a failure, but that we work very closely with cities on is not looking at the performance of the individual deployment, but how are we helping um, optimize your overall network, right? And so are you able to move fixed route buses at night that are inefficient and, and poorly utilized and replace it with on demand? Uh, it's a very interesting proposition where you said the city owns the data. Uh, can you say, um, can you let me know how exactly are you protecting that data uh, and not 
selling it to, to outside parties? And also, why are you not trying to monetize the, the data? Yeah, it, it, it's a good question and, and sort of an easy answer for us. That data is your data. These are your riders, just like on your mass transit network. Um, monetizing the data would uh, kind of uh, eliminate the trust between us and the cities. The only way we use that data is operationally, so we're looking at where people are going, not the individuals themselves, so we can help you optimize your network. Do you work with um, hospitality industry, for example, where their employees have a, you know, don't necessarily live in the city, cost burden, that sort of thing? Yeah, I think one of the major use cases is if you think about sort of a, a night bus, for instance, it's going to be inconvenient, it's going to come infrequently, and the quality of service for that rider coming off of a service job at 2 in the morning is going to be very high. Uh, and so by putting on an on-demand service, you're basically empowering them, you're giving them hours back, giving them reliable transportation. We work with cities uh, and a variety of major employers so that those employers can oftentimes subsidize that service and buy into it so that they could run sort of a combined fleet. No company wants to be in the bus business running their own sort of separate shuttles for employees, but employee sort of lateness is a, and productivity is a huge piece of this. Thanks very much. All right, our last pitch of the session is Felix Brandon Lloyd of Zubin. Hi, my name is Felix, and I'd first like to share that I'm an educator by background and was once named Teacher of the Year for Washington, D.C. So, <laughs> so I share your commitment to literacy, and I'm excited today to talk about how we can work together to offer mayoral reading challenges to uplift reading across your communities. Kids who read just 20 minutes per day take in 1.8 million more words and are more likely to score in the ninth percentile of state tests. Even for adults, reading just six minutes a day can reduce your stress by 60%. Yet we know that the youngest of us often enter kindergarten 30 million words behind. And those deficits grow over the summer until by third grade, many have fall off, fallen off what we call the reading cliff, whereby they cannot catch up. That's where our company comes in. See, we work with over 7,000 libraries and schools across the country, including many represented by mayors in this room. And we are deeply passionate about motivating communities to read more. Our clients often call us their Fitbit for reading. And many of those clients are mayors, like you. Let me explain. See, in Dallas, the mayor challenges the entire community to read X number of books, depending on the age, and for everybody to read at least a little bit for 50 days during the summer. In Atlanta, the superintendent has a race to read reading challenge, whereby the entire community of students are encouraged to read an equivalent of a half, ma half marathon worth 13.1 million minutes. Our software in both cases provides the solution to customize these reading challenges and then to deeply engage the community. We provide an ecosystem of tools that make it easy to track reading wherever you are, whether it be our software connected to the learning management system at school, a mobile app on the go, Alexa at home, or even printed reading logs for folks that don't have Wi-Fi access or where Wi-Fi may be distracting to the reading experience. From there, we provide all the things you need to track the reading, earn virtual badges and centers, and stay motivated to read all year long. The final result is a comprehensive, comprehensive set of data that provides all types of independent reading metrics, including grade level, ethnicity, gender, and other important measures linked to academic and social outcomes. But here's the bottom line. Independent reading volume is the single biggest predictor of reading achievement. Yet, in many cases, we know reading challenges will inspire kids to read 20% more, and to 40% more indicate they love to read. At the same time, our software can increase how much your libraries use and cultivate a community and culture of reading at large. The cherry on top, whether it be Mayor Rawlings in Dallas, or Mayor Glenn Jacobs in Knox County, or the mayor of Nashua, New Hampshire, we know that reading challenges garner great press. And they garner goodwill from today's voters and tomorrow's leaders. So let's partner to inspire your readers across your community to read more. Reading is indeed, is indeed to the brain as exercise is to the body. Together, we can make your city the most fit to read in all of America. 
Thank you for your time today. Keep reading. You know, you should have done just a little bit more research and found out that one of your judges has a big reading program. I didn't know the judges until now. <laughs> but you're Kansas City, right? Uh-huh. And we work with Mid-Continent Public Library. There you go. There All you right. Go. It's a little better now. All right. <laughs> you got you to gotta, you gotta learn how to score those points. All right. Hey, here's, here's the thing. Um, our reading uh, work uh, has been focused on third grade reading proficiency. Absolutely and raising the 33.8% uh, proficiency level up to 55 and it's taken seven years. Mm -hmm. We found that the best way to approach that is by having intensive reading programs and reading buddies with kids. Absolutely. Now, it seems to me that you're relying on somebody to help these kids read. Who are those people that you expect to sit with them and get them to read and help them with the phonics and understanding the words and all of that? I think a key, key takeaway to understand is this the entire community reading. So in many cases, it is the kid reading with someone else. It's the parent reading. It's the teacher reading with the child. So it depends on the target age. From birth to five, it's often going to be a parent, a librarian. But in middle school, it's those kids themselves. So our goal is to keep them motivated to read and to make it really easy for them to track reading and discover the next great book. Okay. So you didn't describe any sensor or artificial intelligence that's actually accounting for whether I actually read the book. And I'm, I'm curious, the, as, as we, as we um, done our, our Merrill reading challenges. We've, we've had the challenge of both having some incentives for folks to do it, but not too many because we don't want them to just make up, make up reading days and reading and books that they may have not read. Right. How does the system encourage that sort of accountability? Is sort of my first question. The second one is, is the data exportable in the form of badges or other things that mm -hmm. both the schools and city promise programs and other things can mm -hmm. use um, the reading data in order to provide more incentives yeah, for on, after on school pri pri priorities, on, for example? Yeah, on the second part, absolutely. So the badges are often tied to larger benefits. In Louisville, I think the mayor from Louisville is here, they have a whole cultural pass program that the badges are tied to. On your first question, uh, you're asking around accountability around reading. So we do have some things, both we can measure automatically if they read some ebooks, so we know that automatically. And then we also have different prompts that aren't multiple choice, but we'll ask a question such as, uh, if you were the main character, which scene would you have pulled yourself out of and replaced the setting? Things like that. Thanks, guys. Want those pictures great, guys? That was amazing. I want to thank these incredibly talented uh, entrepreneurs and, and judges. Thank you as well for, for participating. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, we have about one more minute uh, for you to log your votes, which you can cast inside the USCM mobile app. It's available on iPhone, iPad, and Android. And I invite you to, to vote right now if you've not done so already. Uh, as we're tabulating votes, um, I'd like to invite Elizabeth Trong. She was a winner of this year's uh, Civic I.O. Mayor Summit at South by Southwest. Elizabeth? Hi. Aloha. I'm Dr. Liz Trong, psychiatrist and co-founder of Cloud9. Since shutting down mental institutions, emergency rooms, jails, courts, and the streets have become the dumping grounds for mental illness. First responders and courts spend hours and massive city resources trying to help my patients instead of maintaining public safety. My patients, our citizens, are caught in a failed cycle because after release from these inappropriate facilities, they keep coming back. Our problem is so severe that up to 50% of frequent ER users and up to 65% of inmates have a mental illness or substance use issue. Communities are racing to solve this problem by placing social workers as ride-alongs in police cars. These widely adopted programs are effective in reducing ER and jail visits, but as you can imagine, they're also costly. They put clinicians in harm's way and are just not scalable. Cloud9's mobile app and software platform connects your public health agency to your local first responders with data, real-time communications, and IT systems integrations. We connect mental health clinician teams to law enforcement, EMS, and fire 
in the field to treat citizens whenever and wherever they're having a crisis in your city. Cloud9's intervention features allow clinicians and first responders appropriate data and access to a talk, video, texting, and uh, texting and video platform in order to treat citizens wherever they're having that crisis on the scene. Arming officers with Cloud9 gives patients and people the treatment they need while returning officers to maintaining city public safety faster. The Cloud9 intervention workflow breaks that failed cycle of dumping people in jails and ERs by routing and connecting people back to community mental health care services, social services, and family and friends. If hospitalization is needed, we can route to the most appropriate psychiatric hospital. And we proved this works with the Harris County Sheriff's Office in Houston, Texas. Officers reported that 97% of Cloud9 remote care was equal or superior to their own ride-along model. We showed an immediate 632% return on investment in the same budget cycle for our customer compared to what they were already spending. But the bigger human and economic impact is our proven 22% decrease in ER and jail visits. When scaled up for a city like Houston, we could save $100 million a year. Because of these results, we measure community impact uh, and success through economic sustainability for your city. For example, when deployed with a mid to large size city, uh, with 40 to 60 of your officers, you help 480 people while saving $400,000 in year one. With reasonable expansion, you help 27,000 people by year three, and you save 23 million just by getting people the treatment they need. Cloud9 costs about 12% of what you could potentially save, which not only allows you to pay for our software, but you can then reinvest in the health of your city. We've had three successful deployments, and our first-to-market technology and service model innovation have won five national competitions in a row. Thanks to our very own Mayor Adler and Austin City Council members for giving us the Smart City Innovation Award and now working with us. We're making Austin our flagship innovation city. Special thanks to Civic I.O. and the U.S. Conference of Mayors for national recognition that Cloud9 solution is a vital priority for mayors. Your platform has allowed us to share what we've learned here in Texas and partner with cities from across the country. The time to disrupt this failed system is now. Social, political, and regulatory shifts are allowing and empowering cities to lead change and fix this problem. Public awareness and voter support are driving bipartisan legislative reform and funding for both mental health and criminal justice. State Medicaid's are rapidly paying for Cloud9 solution and national Medicaid will soon follow. Your city can kickstart change and can actually sustain these shifts by connecting your public health and public service agencies with Cloud9. Our software and our team's consulting can help you leverage these new regulations and dollars. Cloud9 is here to change the system. We're looking for leaders and cities who want to stop spending on a broken system and get citizens the treatment they need when they need it most. We have room for additional pilot cities, so please join us. You can find us today or you can contact us here and on our website at cloud9psych.com. Mahalo and good luck to all the companies and contestants today. Ladies and gentlemen, we just need to take one minute to tabulate the scores for our tech pitch winner, so please stand by.
right, at this time I want to invite our five finalists back onto stage to announce, to announce the results. I really want to thank our friends from Cape Port Capital again. Afrida's here. Um, Mitch uh, is, is, is not with us today, but Lily and Brian, uh, your partners, and of course our friend uh, Joteka, who helped bring us all together. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful partnership. Uh, these are all great pitches, and we're really excited to see how uh, each of your concepts and ideas continues uh, to grow. Um, so the winner of our second place award is Court Buddy. And now our first place winner with a trip, with a prize uh, of a trip to Civic I.O. Mayor Summit at South by Southwest is Promise. Everyone, let's give a round of applause to all of today's winners. All right. All right. take a point of personal uh, privilege uh, to recognize one of our leadership mayors who will be leaving office. Um, we just joined on stage, blessed with the leadership and insight of Sly James uh, one more time. Uh, Sly has served as mayor of Kansas City, Missouri for two full terms. He's a member of our advisory board. He serves as co-chair of our small business and entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship uh, task force. Um, he has been a leader in education excellence, uh, displaying a deep uh, commitment to improving Kansas City schools. Uh, he's revitalized Kansas City's economy, bringing both innovation and technological advancement. Uh, his innovative spirit and legacy of collaboration will continue to live on. Uh, and so, so proud to call him a dear friend. Uh, please join me in, in thanking Sly James for his service to Kansas City and to the U.S. Conference of Mayors. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I can tell you that uh, having served eight years in the city that I grew up in and loved as the mayor has been the professional honor of my life. Uh, that honor has been enhanced by getting to know so many of you and understanding uh, what you and what we as mayors are to the vitality and the governance of this country. Every mayor and everybody associated with mayors should hold their head proud and be happy to be associated with that level of government that actually does stuff. Uh, it is important. Uh, we are accountable to our constituents every day. We don't engage in senseless, needless, long arguments about esoterica. We get things done. We take care of our people. We learn to bring people together. And the fact that you're all here again uh, with the U.S. Conference is evidence of the fact of how much we care about each other and how much we care about the jobs that we do. Thank you so much. It's an honor to have served with you. I will see you uh, some more. Just because I'm not going to be mayor doesn't mean I'm not going to be around. I will always be around. I will always be a mayor, if not named, certainly in heart. Thank you all very much. Tell Sly is sliding out of office. He still had a minute left on the clock. And you guys know Sly James. Uh, usually he needs a couple of extra few minutes. He, uh, um, he's, he's getting ready to do, have a, a great success in, in private life. We are going to miss uh, him something, something awful, something awful. So um, we're about to slip into our, our, our business uh, meeting uh, after a while. Uh, because we're going to be considering resolutions this morning, I urge you to make sure uh, you review the section in your program that explains the process uh, the credentials process is on page five, or look in the notes, notices section of our, of our app. Uh, please make sure you have your credential card uh, in hand to be counted uh, during any votes. Um, so now we're going to be begin our business uh, session. I'll ask your mayors um, um, that speak, please keep your remarks concise. Um, in the interest of saving time, 
If there's no objection, uh, debate will be limited to two speeches of two minutes per mayor per question. Uh, and uh, if there's no objection, uh, as there's no objection, the rule is, is adopted for this, for this meeting. Is that, is that so? All right. All right. So thank you, Mayor. The Mayor of the National City agrees. Um, the first item of business is to consider the resolutions uh, before us, uh, which if passed will become the official policy of the, of the uh, Conference of Mayors. Uh, the resolutions have come from the standing uh, committee. Yeah, come on, bring it on up. Uh, the full membership may also consider any new resolution proposed by a member mayor at this session. Consideration of new resolutions requires a two-thirds vote of members present and voting. Uh, any new resolutions will be considered after voting on all resolutions approved in the standing committees. Uh, at this time, the chair would like to know if any member mayor is offering a new resolution. All right. The United States Conference of Mayors um, Executive Committee adopted a new rule uh, that allows mayors to record a no vote on a specific resolution that is adopted in either a committee meeting or the business session during the annual meeting. In both cases, the mayor must be present uh, for the vote. Uh, for committee pass resolution, the mayor also must be a member of the committee. Uh, this new rule will not change the voting results on the resolution, but to register a no vote on the resolution that passes uh, during the business session, uh, go to the resolution section in the 87th annual meeting um, um, section of the app and tap the resolution on which you wish to vote. A vote button will be visible at the lower portion of the screen. Um, mayors, their staff, or their city representative will have until 3 p.m. Hawaii time on Monday, July 1st, uh, today, to register the no vote. All right. All right. So now we're going to consider uh, resolutions from the standing committee. Uh, the resolutions will be considered uh, committee by committee in the order listed in the resolutions book, which you have before you. The procedure will be as followed. First, the chair of each committee or designee will make a brief presentation of that committee's resolutions and then move for their adoption. Next, I will ask for a second. And then I'll ask if any member mayor wants to have an individual resolution pulled for special consideration. Once the resolutions uh, to be pulled have been identified and set aside, we'll vote on the remaining resolutions for that committee as a block. Uh, we'll go through this procedure for all standing committees. Then we're going to have a discussion on the resolutions pulled for special consideration, followed by a separate vote on each one. After that, we will take up any new resolutions, which it appears we have none. If parliamentary uh, issues should arise during our debate, we have our professional parliamentarian present. Um, I know some of you have parliamentary uh, uh, training. We don't need it today. Okay, we have one uh, who, who will help us and assist us in resolving them. His name is Tim Wynn. All right. So we're going to start. I apologize. Ed? Um, so uh, we're going to have, uh, first up, Mayor LaVar Stoney of Richmond, Virginia, the chair of the Children, Health, and Human Services uh, Committee. Mayor Stoney. Mr. President, I'm LaVar Stoney, the mayor of the city of Richmond and chair of the Children, Health, and Human Services Standing Committee. I am pleased to report that the committee met on Saturday and considered 14 resolutions in a timely fashion and four new resolutions submitted at the committee. Mr. President, I move that resolutions numbered 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 18, and 114, 115, 116, 117 be adopted. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mayor Stoney. Uh, I now call for a second on the resolutions as moved. All right. Does any mayor have a resolution to be pulled? I now call for a vote on the resolutions in block. 
excluding any resolutions and pull. There have been none. All those in favor uh, say yay. yay. All opposed, like sign. The yeas have it and the resolutions are passed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, know, I now call on Gary Mayor Karen Freeman Wilson of the Criminal and Social Justice Committee. Mr. President, the Criminal and Social Justice Committee met on June 29th and considered 29 resolutions submitted in a timely fashion, a record number for our committee and I believe for any committee. In addition, the committee considered one new resolution. The committee reported out all 30 of these resolutions for consideration in the business session. This morning, Rest Sacramento Mayor Christopher Capalton held the first meeting of the U.S. Conference of Mayors LGBTQ. Coalition and discussed two resolutions that were considered by our committee. Resolution number 41, supporting the LGBTQ rights, and resolution number 111, in support of the Equality Act, H.R. 5. Several mayors asked to be listed as co-sponsors, and since it was too late for them to do this online, I wanted to read their names now. Elizabeth Kautz, Mayor Burnsville, Mayor Greg Fisher of Louisville, Mayor Gleam Davis of Santa Monica, Mayor Nancy Backus of Auburn, Washington, Mayor David Halbert of Dublin, California, Mayor Bobby Hopewell of Kalamazoo, Michigan, Mayor Alejandra Sotelo Solis of National City, and myself, Karen Freeman Wilson. At this time, I would move the adoption of resolutions number 24, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 111, and 120. Uh, I didn't hear all that. Can you repeat it one more time, please? <laughs> Does any mayor have a resolution to be pulled? All right. I now call for a resolution, a vote on the resolutions in block. Uh, all those in favor say uh, yay. yay. All opposed, like sign. Uh, the yeas have and the resolutions have passed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. President, a point of personal privilege. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I just wanted to, one, thank you for your acknowledgement um, earlier in the conference and wanted to thank my colleagues for all of their well wishes and kind words. Well, we love you, Karen. You know that. Well, I love you all. I now call on the mayor of New Bedford, uh, Mayor John Mitchell, chair of the Energy Committee. Morning, Mr. President. Good morning, everybody. Uh, the Energy Committee convened on Saturday, June 29th to consider six resolutions submitted in a timely manner. A seventh resolution was introduced uh, and garnered more than two-thirds of the committee vote to agree to consider it, and that's numbered uh, Resolution 121. Uh, I now hereby move for the adoption of resolutions numbered 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, and 121, not nearly as many as Mayor Freeman Wilson. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Mayor Mitchell. Is there a second? All right, does any mayor have a resolution that needs to be pulled? All right, and I call for a vote on the resolutions in block. Uh, all those in favor say yay. yay. All opposed, like sign. Thank you, Mayor Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. President. Now I call on uh, Ro Mayor of Rochester Hills, Michigan, Mayor uh, Brian Barnett, speaking on behalf of the Environment Committee. Mayor Barnett. Good morning, Mr. President. The Environment Committee met on Saturday, June 29th to consider 11 resolutions submitted in a timely uh, manner, of which four were shared with the Energy Committee and one with inter International Affairs. A 12th resolution was also introduced by a committee member with more than two-thirds of the committee voting for its consideration and adoption. So therefore, I move the adoption of resolutions 54, 55, 56, 57, 
60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, and 122. Thank awesome. you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mayor Barnett. Um, uh, here a second. second. All right. Does any mayor have a resolution to be pulled? All right. Seeing none, I now call for a vote on the resolutions in block. All those in favor say yay. yay. Opposed, like sign. All right. All right. The yeas have it. Thank you, Mayor Barnett. The, um, I now call on Dayton Mayor uh, Nan Whaley, Chair of International Affairs. Thank you, Mr. President. The International Affairs Standing Committee met on June 29th to consider 10 resolutions submitted in a timely fashion and three new resolutions submitted at the committee. I move that resolutions number 48, 49, 60, 60, I'm sorry, 61, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 120, 123, 124 be adopted. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mayor Welly. Is there a second? All right, a second. Does a mayor have a resolution to be pulled? I now call for a vote on the resolutions in block. All those in favor say yay. yay. Opposed, like sign. The yeas have it. The resolutions are passed. Thank you, Mayor Welly. Um, next is West Sacramento Mayor Christopher Cabaldon, Chair of the Jobs, Education, and Workforce Committee. Mayor Cabaldon. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, your Standing Committee on Jobs, Education, and the Workforce uh, met on Friday, June 28th. Uh, brevity being the soul of wit, we are reporting only five resolutions uh, to you today. Those five resolutions submitted in a timely manner. And so I move for the adoption of resolutions 74, 75, 2, 3, and 76. Thank you, Mr. President. All right. Thank you, Mayor Cabaldon. Is there a second? All right. Uh, does anyone have a resolution that needs to be pulled? All right. I see none. I call for a vote on the resolutions in block. All those in favor say yay. yay. Opposed, like sign. All right. The yeas have it. Thank you, Mayor Cabaldon. Now I call on Arlington Mayor Jeff Williams uh, for a report from the Metro Economies Committee. Thank you, President Benjamin. I'm pleased to report that the Metro Economies Standing Committee met last Saturday and we considered 19 resolutions that were submitted before the May deadline and one new resolution. All resolutions were approved. Mr. President, I move the adoption of the following resolutions. Numbers 17, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, and we're not going 95. We're going 125 for our last one there. 125 bottles of beer on the wall. Okay, we're, we're good. That was, that was a lot, Jeff. Thank you very much. Is there a second? All right. Does, does any mayor have a resolution to be pulled? I now call for a vote on the resolutions in block. All those in favor say yay. yay. All opposed, like sign. The yeas have it. Thank you so much, Mayor Wims. We'll now hear from Burnsville Mayor and Past President uh, Mayor Elizabeth Couts uh, for the Tourism, Arts, Parks, Entertainment, and Sports Committee report. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. We, we hot? Thank you, Mr. President. I, I report on behalf of uh, Chair of the uh, Tapes Committee, Mayor Shivi. She had to fly home. Yeah. But on behalf of the um, our chair and the um, Tourism, Arts, Parks, Entertainment, and Sports Committee. We met on Saturday, the 29th at 8 a.m. and approved the following resolutions. 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, and then we went to 126. Uh, Mr. President, uh, we, uh, we ask that the uh, body adopt uh, the resolutions as presented. Thank you, Mayor Couts. Is there a second? Does any mayor have a resolution to be pulled? All right, seeing none, I now call for a vote on the resolutions in block. Uh, all those in favor say yay. yay. Opposed, like sign. Uh, the resolutions are passed. Thank you, Mayor Couts. Um, now I have a report from the mayor of Plano, Texas, Harold Ross Lear, um, who is the chair of the Transportation and Communications Committee. Harry. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, on behalf of the Transportation and Communications Committee, we met on Saturday, June the 9th, to consider 10 resolutions submitted in a timely manner. 
Two were in combi combined into one, and before us today, we have nine resolutions for your approval for adoption. I move adoption of resolution number 58, 103, 104, 105, 106, 107, 108, 109, and 110. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, now call for a second on the resolutions as moved. All right. Does any mayor have a resolution to be pulled? Now I call for a vote on the resolutions in block. All those in favor say yay. yay. Opposed, like sign. Uh, the yeas have and the resolutions are passed. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, okay. Yes, sir. Now I call on for our final report, um, uh, the Mayor of Mesa, Arizona, John Giles of the Community Development and Housing Committee. Mayor Giles. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the Community Development and Housing Committee met on Saturday, June 29th, to consider 15 resolutions submitted in a timely manner. Uh, the committee adopted two new resolutions. So I move for the adoption of resolutions 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, and then 113, 118, and 119. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Now I call for a second on the resolutions as moved. All right. Does any mayor have a resolution that needs to be pulled? All right. Seeing none, now I call for a vote on the resolutions and block. Uh, all in favor say yay. yay. All opposed, like sign. The yeas have it, and the resolutions are passed. Thank you, Mayor Joss. All right. All right, you guys see how smoothly that went? All right, Barnett, take notes, man. That's how you run a meeting, okay? <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, so now I'd um, like to move a privileged resolution uh, thanking uh, Mayor Kirk Caldwell for such a special annual conference. Uh, you know, please. resolutions before you, um, so I'm, I'm just going to read the final resolved clause, be it further resolved that the United States Conference of Mayors extends its gratitude to Mayor Caldwell, city staff, volunteers, sponsors, and the people of the great city of Honolulu for an extraordinary and incredibly productive annual meeting. Have a move this resolution. I ask for a second. All those in favor say yay. yay. All right. The resolution is unanimously approved. Thank you so much, Kirk, uh, for a wonderful experience. And this concludes our resolutions discussion. Uh, I'm now going to invite up the chairman of the nominating committee uh, to give his report, Mayor Harry LaRozier of, of Plano, Texas. Oh, please. He comes up with his report. Let's do it from there. Let me do it from there. Okay. Okay. And Thank as Mayor, uh, as Harry, you guys check the seat out? Is he not? You look amazing today, man. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, uh, come on up and come. Tom says, come on up. Come, we we want to see the suit while you report. Come on. Well, I had to wear my Sunday best for Mayor Bra Brian Barnett, so <laughs> it's the best I could come up for you. All right. So uh, the 2019 nominating committee met on Saturday, June 29th, and the following mayors were nominated for the following positions. And it is with uh, great enthusiasm and a little trepidation. Our first, uh, first person we, we uh, would nominate is for president is Brian K. Barnett, Mayor of Rochester Hills. Let's give him a hand. We're so excited. Vice President, the compassionate mayor, Greg Fisher, Mayor of Louisville. 
second vice president, Nan Whaley, mayor of Dayton, Ohio. Or we call her Nanette. If you're really close here, you get to call her Nanette. Uh, and for the tr four trustees, Mayor Hardy Davis Jr., Augusta, Georgia, Mayor Hillary Sheevy, Reno, Mayor Francis Suarez, Miami, Mayor Sylvester Turner of Houston. For advisory board, we have 10 positions. Mayor Michelle De La Issa, Topeka, Kansas. Mayor Robert Garcia, Long Beach, California. Mayor Andrew Ginther, Columbus, Ohio. Mayor David Holt, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Mayor Lily May, Fremont, California. Mayor Betsy Price, Fort Worth, Texas. Mayor Michael Tubbs, Stockton, Stockton California. Mayor Karen Weaver, Flint, Michigan. Mayor Jeff Williams, Arlington, Texas, and Mayor Victoria Woodard, Tacoma, Washington. Respectfully submitted by Harry Ross Lear, Mayor of Plano, Texas. Thank you. Always oh, very uh, difficult work on nominating committee. I want to thank uh, the chairman and, and all the nominating committee members for their, for their hard work. I now call for a vote to accept the report of the nominating committee. All those in favor say yay. yay. All opposed? Uh, none. Like uh, the, uh, the ayes have it. Uh, congratulations to our new officers, our trustees, and our advisory board members. So I'm going to ask our new officers, President Barnett, Vice President Fisher, Second Vice President Whaley, come and join us on the stage. <laughs> And before uh, the officers sneak off, Mayor Whaley and Mayor Fisher, will you stay up here with me for just a moment? Uh, as my first act as uh, Conference of Mayors President, I'm pleased to move a privileged resolution honoring our immediate past president. Go ahead, let me just uh, read the uh, couple resolved uh, clause. It says, now therefore be it resolved that we honor Mayor Steve Benjamin for brilliantly and fiercely leading the United States Conference of Mayors as its 86th president. And be it further resolved that we recognize the endless support, love, and uh, the endless love and support of his parents, Sam and Maggie Benjamin, his wife, Deandra, his parents-in-law, Donald and Adrian Gist, his daughters, Bethany and Jordan Grace, and other members of his family and community. Having moved this resolution, I would ask for a second. second. All in favor of honoring my friend, Mayor Benjamin, say aye. Opposed, just get out because we don't even need you here. <laughs> the motion is approved unanimously. Can we give our friend and our leader, Mayor Benjamin, one more round of applause? This will end our business session. We'll be back in just a little bit for our luncheon and our final plenary session. 
a good afternoon, and we'll see you in a little bit. Thank you. We're adjourned. He wants another one.